All right, good morning. Oh, um, so I've been thinking about this uh, a lot, and I think that a mental attitude of futility and, oh, what's the point and worthlessness is often a huge contributing factor to the way and why people age the way they do. Today I want to talk about something that I think is really important because we are a culture and we are a city that is obsessed with youth. Obsessed, I tell you. <laughs> so the first thing, because your mind is the most important thing you have to work with, we teach in the science of mind, don't let an old person move into your body, I don't care what age you are. Do not let an old person move in. Now. We teach in the science of mind that who you really are, your true identity is that you are spirit, you are mind, you are consciousness, you are a soul, and that life, that life of God that you uniquely individualize is endless. Spirit in us was never born, and spirit that is within us can never die. Spirit is God. God has no beginning, God has no end. And life is a journey, onward, upward, Godward, there you have it, right? So what has been form, tends to become formless. What has been formless tends to become form. That's just what we see. So, you know, I like to go to the authorities on these things. So for this, I went to Sophia Loren. <laughs> there is a fountain of youth. It is your mind, your talents, the creativity you bring to your life and the lives of the people you love. When you learn to tap this source, you will truly have defeated age. Thank you, Sophia Loren. Yeah, how about that? Your mind, your talents, and your creativity that you bring to your life and the lives of those you love. Yes, I think that's very empowering. So we hear people say it like it's a dirty word, old age. It's just change. We should welcome it gladly as another step on a path that has no end. See, if you could really see the timeline of your existence, it would curve back on itself and it spirals upward. And science of mind teaches us that you never cease to exist. Right? So how could you be old on a continuum where you never cease to exist? Spirit, which is your true identity, cannot grow old. Our life is spirit, renewing, indestructible. I remember hearing somebody talk about growing old gracefully. I found that so incredibly distasteful. I mean, I really did. It's like, hell no, I won't go. Grow old gracefully? What does that mean? Surrender into my rocking chair? That's what that sounds like to me in my head. Oh, you just need to grow old gracefully. Oh, well, why don't you just dig a hole for me now and I'll jump in? Yeah. Grow old, I will not. I will kick and scream and defy the whole notion as long as I have breath in my body. Emerson said, we do not count a man's years until he has nothing else to count. Hmm. Now, Mark Twain, on the other hand, said, the heart is the real fountain of youth. Isn't that beautiful? The heart is the real fountain of youth. So I believe that your character, your quality of mind, your faith, and convictions are not subject to decay in any way. That's just not how it works. There was an article a while back in the LA Times. I'm going back years now, but I always read. I'm always reading, so I don't know when I read things. Maybe I read this when I was a child. No, I wasn't in LA. But anyway, a long time ago, in a land far, far away, known as Los Angeles, there was a newspaper. Oh, this, this is how people got information a long time ago, newspapers. So, anyway, uh, and it talked about people who were over 80 years old who were doing really well, okay? Not people who were 80 years old and woke up to just complain about the day. People who were 80 years old and doing really well. And they surveyed thousands of people. And you know what the common denominator was? They had at least... 16 social interactions a month. Now, phone calls didn't count. Emails didn't count. I'm sorry, 
Facebook friends didn't count. <laughs> you do know they're not really your friends, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Just, just so you know. I mean, I know it's nice to be in touch and stuff, but, you know, if they're not showing up with the chicken soup when you're down, they are not really your friends. I'm sorry. 16 social interactions a month. That meant that you and I, we went to the movies once a month. And that you and I, we played cards every Thursday. And that you and I, we went for a walk on Wednesday mornings. And you and I, we did this, that. You know, but people got together and they did stuff. Meaning they talked and engaged and experienced newness and interacted and probably touched a little bit. All that kind of crazy stuff. Really wild. Those people were thriving at over 80 years old. Lots and lots of social interactions and dates every month. You know, I think when we're young, it's really easy to find somebody who's a really good model who's the decade ahead of us. Don't you think? You know, when you're a teenager, you see people who are in their 20s and you think, oh my God, I want to be just like that. They're doing so great. I'm ready to step into those shoes. And you know, when you're in 30s, you can see people who are in their 40s who are doing great. 50s, you can find people who are 60s doing great and inspire you. Now, at some point, though, it seems like the good models now, I know they're there, but they seem to be a little more elusive, a little more in hiding. So when you're in your 70s, it's harder to find really good examples of people being in their 80s. And if you're in your 80s, you've got to really look to find somebody who's in their 90s who you say, I want to be just like that. But they're there. They're there. We have to find them. And part of what that does to us is it shows us what's possible. It shows us what's available. So can we find good models, good examples of how we would like to be in every decade that is the decade ahead of us? Now, sometimes we reach a decade and we say, well, there's nobody ahead of me. <laughs> what am I doing here? Well, you're here to be a model for someone else. Just like that idea, the best time to plant trees was 20 years ago, but the second best time is today. Right? So if you didn't plant trees 20 years ago, you plant them now. And that's the same thing about being a model for someone else. Though well, maybe the time for you to have models has passed, but maybe you're supposed to be a really good example showing other people what they might have in store for themselves. I think it's um, all part of divine intelligence that, yeah, we maybe do slow down a little bit, but I think the purpose of that is to be able to take time to go into the silence of our own soul, to commune with the presence of the indwelling God. Now, I know we've all been told, and we've heard it a million times, oh, you're only as old as you feel. But I think, really, you are as old or as young as your thought. You know, we know people who are old at 30, right? They're just ancient. It's like they're channeling the dinosaurs or something. It's like, you're only 30. Why are you so old? I think about my grandparents. Now, my grandparents were part of that generation where Social Security was a new and wonderful thing. Now, they established the age for Social Security at that time as 65 because most people, most people died by 64. That's why they picked 65. Right? They were figuring they weren't going to have to pay out very much money. What they hadn't counted on is that consciousness would advance, technology would advance, medicine would learn and discover all kinds of things that would help us. So although that has shifted, our thinking about what's old has not shifted. My grandparents were really old at 60, or so they thought, and yet they lived another three plus decades. But they thought they were old at 60 because, well, you know, Social Security's coming and we hope we live long enough to get it. <coughs> Other people we know are young at 90 and above. And I suspect, I hold for each of us, that that's the category we want to be a part of. So there was an ancient Greek myth of uh, Heracles who visits his friend, a king. And the king's wife is close to death. Now, she brought it upon herself by volunteering. 
The god Apollo had promised to revive the king if someone would die in his place. And she loved her husband, the king, so much that she said she would rather die than him. And so Heraclitus, um, I'm sorry, Heracles was determined to save her, and so he waited for death to arrive. And when death arrived, he challenged death to a wrestling match. So Heracles is like, uh, will eventually become Hercules in, in later mythology. And so death accepted willingly as he'd never been bested before. Now, death was actually no match for Heracles' strength. And after a long struggle, death was forced to submit and leave without a victim. The king's wife was saved. And our hero had the gratitude of the king. So I like that. I think that, that's a great story. We teach that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Old or young is through the process of our thinking. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, I just let go of five years. Right there, five years, out the nose. Um, <laughs> old or young is through a process of our thinking. You know, Job says in the Old Testament, the thing I fear has come upon me. People fear aging and then act surprised when they actually start to experience it, right? Our culture does this. Our culture does this, right, wrong, or whatever. It's just what we do. You know there are other cultures in the world that revere their elders. I mean, really, they revere them with respect. They put them on a pedestal. They know it's time to listen to the wisdom that they've lived and had experiences that younger people have not had. And I think it's kind of shameful. I think it's kind of shameful. You know, I think we have to embrace it, revere it, respect it. And it doesn't have to look like a rocking chair on the front porch. Actually, I don't know anybody who's done the rocking chair on the front porch thing. See, I think we grow old when we lose interest in life. When we lose interest in life. When we cease to dream, when we cease to hunger after new experiences and new worlds to conquer. Now, years ago, uh, a saint, Saint Irenaeus, said the glory of God is found in the person who is fully alive. And I would say that the person who's fully alive is someone who is not aging according to the idea of the world. You know that, oh, you've reached an age, you shouldn't do this anymore, and you've reached an age, you shouldn't do that anymore. You know, when we were kids, we could not pass a log without jumping up on the log and trying to balance walking on the log, right? And seeing if we could turn around and do it the other way, and isn't that? And then later, oh, the edge of the sidewalk is painted, let me see if I can walk in that. But then we get a little older, and we say, oh, I better not do that. I better not do that. I don't allow myself to do those things. Those were only things I did when I was younger, but not now. So who put up the restriction there? I did. I did. I tell myself. Now, I'm not saying everybody should go like walk on a log this afternoon. If, if that uh, is, eludes you, I think work on your balance first, right? <laughs> you know, for thousands of years all over the world, there was a tale told of a fountain of youth. And if people would drink or bathe in this fountain of youth, it would keep you young forever. Now, Ponce de Leon was searching for the fountain of youth when he traveled to Florida in 1513. But literally for thousands of years before that, people have been looking for this fountain. Hmm. Here's part of what I think it is. What makes you feel fully alive? What makes you feel the most alive, OK? Now, if you say, well, I bungee jumped 10 years ago. I felt pretty alive when I was bungee jumping. I'm going to say, take that off your list, because you can't live on a bungee jump, OK? It's going to really ha be hard to have interpersonal relationships and go to work and carry on your whole life if you're always attached to a bungee cord, right? That's just going to be hard. So, so we'll, we'll say that was a peak experience for you. But what are the things that are more accessible that make you feel most alive? Think about the people in your life who you love to be with that make you feel the most alive. 
You know, that maybe it's your family and your loved ones and your closest friends and your grandkids or whoever. Do you know if you don't know? If you don't know who and what makes you feel the most alive in life, that's your homework this week. That's what you're going to do. What is it? Well, you say, well, you know, when I was younger, what makes to, used to make me feel alive was downhill skiing, but I don't downhill ski anymore. Well, that doesn't mean you're done. It just means you haven't been looking for something else that makes you feel really alive. God is infinite. You say, well, you know, people say again and again, well, you know, I'm just, I'm just so old now. I got to tell you, I hate that. Because I think there's almost always a negative connotation about it. Like people are almost apologizing a little bit. And they think, well, what do I say if I, don't say, if I can't say I'm old? I say, well, it's not that you can't say it. I mean, go ahead. No, but know that there are repercussions for that. Another possibility is say, rather than say, I'm old. <sighs> rather than that, what if we said something like, I'm wise in the ways of God. You'll say, how old do you say? I don't know. I don't keep track, but I am wise in the ways of God. That means I've been paying attention. I've been learning something. See, I think it's important that we have to be really committed that our mind never retires. You know, you are mind itself, your consciousness. You will never have an old mind unless you think you will. And so for us as students in the science of mind, the presence of the indwelling God is the only power. You don't have to have the race experience of aging and sickness and conflict like other people have unless you choose to not take charge of your mind. But if you take charge of your mind, your thinking, your believing, what you're seeing in the picture of your mind's eye, you know, Emma Curtis Hopkins, who is one of our teachers, talks about this idea that when we become aware that there is something that we're saying is an inherited tendency, say, something that came from our parents or our grandparents, and it's maybe not the best thing. But we love them so much. And see, and this is what happens. People love their, their, their people so much that they take on their troubles out of some kind of, it's some kind of wacky loyalty, you know? They say, oh my gosh, my hands look just like my dad's now, and they have the exact same arthritis his hands had. That, now that's crazy thinking, because that's some kind of loyalty and love for my dad. Now, if that person loves you, they would not want you to have their malady, right? <laughs> They would not want you to suffer or struggle with those things. So this is what Emma Curtis Hopkins says we should do. She says, I release the blood and body of my ancestors. So what that means is you get to keep all the wonderful stuff from your family, anything good, anything wonderful, you get to keep that. But the stuff that does not serve your spiritual evolution, the stuff that does not serve the growth of your soul, you get to consciously release it. So I release the blood and body of my ancestors. I want you to say that with me. I release the blood and body of my ancestors. Yeah, feels pretty good, doesn't it? Now, that's no disrespect for anything they've been, done, or been through. See, I think, I think we have enough youth. How about a fountain of smart? <laughs> I don't know, just an idea. Just an idea. What if we had a fountain of, you know, I mean, why are we going for youth? We should be going for a fountain of smart. So this week I, I wrote down just a few things, and I thought, this is the kind of stuff I want to say to myself. I, so I said, I am wise in the ways of God. So say that with me. I am wise in the ways of God. I think young, feel young, and act young. Say it. I think healthy, feel healthy, and act healthy. I think happy, feel happy, and act happy. Okay, we're going to work on the memory thing. <laughs> no, that's good. I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing you. <laughs> the bottom line, the truth is that the love and the wisdom that exist within you right now are ageless. 
That's what I think we want to be in touch with every day. That God has placed within each of us love and wisdom, and that love and wisdom that's within us is the most true, most real thing about us, and it is absolutely ageless. Let's pray. So we, <laughs> so we turn our attention inward now for a moment, recognizing that right here where we are, the fullness, the allness of God's Spirit is. I know that we are surrounded and filled and sustained by God's love and wisdom. It is the most true, real thing about us. And so in this awareness, I claim for each and every one of us that we are not bound by the thinking of the world around us or the patterns of our family and ancestors, that we are a free being in God right now, free to have our own evolution, our own growth in consciousness, our own experience of life. And I claim for each and every one of us that we are living the abundant life right now, abundant in every good and perfect way. And so we include in our prayer today our family members and friends and loved ones. We know that right where they are, God is, in its fullness, in its allness. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world around us. So all those things that are pulling at our attention, clamoring for us to get excited and worked up about, we say God is right there even in the midst of that. God is present everywhere as peace, as right action, as all needs met, as harmony and union. We bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And we let our prayer be a special blessing on all world leaders. Not just our leaders, leaders everywhere on the face of the globe. That they be illumined with the light and love of infinite spirit. That it guide them in all of their decisions. And that we are in fact all, each and every one of us, blessed this day. So with a full heart, I say, thank you, God. I release this word. I know it's done, and so it is. Together we all say, amen.